doing a Jewish vow in order not to offend the Jews. But as Paul was allowing for Jews to still accomplish ceremonies with a national symbol and reason, he was adamant never to impose that on Gentiles. Because on Gentiles, that will mean slavery, putting them under a law that were not for them, the ceremonial law that is. So those ceremonial laws, whether the dietary, circumcision, and others, were not imposed by Paul on the Gentiles. In fact, it was adamant that it should not be done because that was not according to, to the truth of the gospel. Remember the Antioch controversy recorded in Galatians 2, where while he allowed Timothy to be circumcised, Timothy being a Jew, he said that he did not give in, not even for an hour, to have titles circumcised as a ceremonial law. So there we see that uh, for Paul, the ceremonial law will have some continuation with Jews, uh, but he did not allow it to be imposed on Gentiles. And when the Jews themselves were scattered, there no longer was any national identity which was geographical after the uh, destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. So since then, even the ceremonial law was fully abrogated. Paano po naligtas sa mga tao sa Old Testament noong panahon na yon na wala pa po ang sacrifice ni Jesus Christ? Uh, ito ang tinatawag natin sa Hebrews 7.22 na, na wala na aking whiteboard. <laughs> In Hebrews 7.22, it speaks of surety. Surety is what we would call today collateral where uh, a person in debt when his debt matures and is unable to pay the one who has the collateral will uh, will take the obligation of the debt and what that's what jesus did so what was what the old testament saints were unable to do or to uh, possess Jesus Christ, when he fulfilled the cross, it has a carryover effect on Old Testament saints. But in the Old Testament itself, the form of salvation was promissory. I explain it, or I illustrate it often this way. We have a lot of calamities to deal with almost every year. And when there's a calamity and a, uh, <clears throat> a state of calamity is declared in a place uh, that government promises aids to be sent to that place. But of course, in order to have some control, they need to identify who the recipients, who the legitimate recipients of aid should be. So either the barangay captain or the mayor will give certificates that they are proper recipients of the aid to come. But while they're happy they have that certificate, it's not just possession. It's when the trucks of AIDS come that they will have the, risk, the possession of what was promised in the certificate. Now, that's the Old Testament form of salvation. The Old Testament form of salvation is the promissory note, a promissory certificate, which is guaranteed because it's God who gave it to them. There is no way that the promise of God will fail. So, the, there is a guarantee for their salvation but as to the possession of it, it only happens when the salvation in Christ came. So you must not think that the salvation of the New Testament saints is just the same as the Old Testament saints. It is both by faith in the promised Messiah. But in the case of the New Testament, it is now fully possessed, where in the Old Testament it was but promised. You see this in Romans 3, 24 following, where Apostle Paul says that as far as the sins of those who have committed those sins were concerned, what did God do so that judgment may not fall upon them? Forbearance. Nagtimpi ang Diyos. Hindi ibinagsak ang hatol sa kanila sapagkat siya ay nagtimpi forbearance but in christ 
the full wrath fell upon Christ. So that in the case of the New Testament saints, it's not only forbearance, but full justification in the sense that the wrath of God will no longer fall on them. There is therefore now, that's the now of Paul, there is therefore now no more condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So there is a difference. And we must think of progress when we think of New Testament experience of salvation. Another question, hello, Pastor Noel. My question, what is, my question is, what is the meaning of Christian liberty? Christian liberty, I'm defining it here at present as liberty from the, legalis, the legalism of the law, which sees the law as their means of obedience instead finding it as condemning. So the first instance of liberty is liberty from condemnation of the law. Now that does not mean, as I have cautioned, that you are free to live without the standard of the law. That will be antinomianism. So the first instance of Christian liberty has to do with the law, that it is no longer condemning us who are in Christ, but that means we are also free to obey the law. But it is not necessarily a perfect obedience, but it's an obedience that God is accepting because of Jesus Christ. Now, in the next two sessions I will have, and I'm sure also Brother Rob Ventura will be addressing this, I will show the implication of the law. In the, my second session, the implication of not law, the implication of liberty in kingship. Again, this is one rarely addressed issue of Christian liberty. There is no liberty of worship, but what that means, we'll wait for the second session tomorrow, God willing, I will show what Christian liberty is as it pertains to pandak, as liberty of conscience. So there's, at present, we are dealing with liberty from the law as a condemning law, but now liberty to obey the law as under Christ through the Holy Spirit. Now the question, my uh, vocal. Go ahead. Pastor, there's one question from the audience, from live audience. Uh, it says, Masama po ba na ang isang Kristiyano ay laging nakatingin sa kanyang kasalanan? Hindi po ba malungkot ito dahil pinapatawad na ang kanyang kasalanan? Paano natin, paano tayo magkakaroon ng kagalakan sa kapatawaran ng kasalanan kung hindi tayo nagkakaroon ng kamalayan ng ating kasalanan? Uh, sa makatwid, magkat, magkat, uh, magkatugma ang dalawang bagay na yon na papalalim ang iyong paggilala sa biyaya ng Diyos kasama ang kanyang kapatawaran kung napapalalim din ang iyong kamalayan, ang iyong kasalanan. So it is grace upon grace as we understand it if we understand it to be a matter of sin upon sin on our part. Uh, and that's why God is with us graciously. So Romans 5.20 says, Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And you know the abundance of grace by acknowledging and being conscious of the abundance of your sin. And this is something that you will know of people as they grow in holiness, they do not grow in the consciousness of their own uh, superlative graces they all the more have a consciousness of the poverty of spirit uh, blessed are the poor in spirit as jesus said so uh, there is no contradiction in knowing more of your sin and thus appreciating more of your grace of, of god's grace uh, mercy and grace are often used interchangeably but where there is a nuance of distinction, mercy pertains to the misery of sin. Whereas grace pertains to the unworthy status of the sinner. And you, have, you need both to appreciate the mercy of God and the grace of God. You need to understand the misery of sin and then the unworthiness that sin makes of you 
and yet God still deals with you because of Jesus Christ. So instead of contradiction, uh, they are correlated. May isang tanong dito, may may recommend po ba kayo yung materials book para maintindihan ko po ang connection ng ceremonial law at kung ano ang purpose ng Diyos sa ceremonial law sa Old Testament at paano ito nagkakaroon ng fulfillment kay Jesus. Uh, maraming mga magagandang materials ngayon uh, but uh, one of the best still is the Puritan book by William Gastery The True Bounds of Christian Freedom uh, where he deals with this issue quite uh, very with, with much insight so, Puritan, meron na rin mga materials na magagamit ngayon uh, I just cannot give you uh, of hand the titles but that's the book that immediately comes to my mind when talking of Christian liberty how many times do we need to repent if we are now free from the curse of the law is repentance a repeatable act now that we are now that we are free from the curse of the law Are we to agree with the current mentality that we only now have to confess our sins but no need to repent? Repentance is only done once. Well, that is not true. You are only talking of conversion repentance just as there is conversion faith. But faith is a continuing grace in the sense that uh, you do not believe now and then the rest, take, uh, the rest of the days, the rest of your life, uh, that faith is a once for all Uh, thing that does not grow the faith grows just as repentance grow there is a beginning but uh, faith and repentance are the disposition of the Christian so when we confess our sins we continually repent we often hear of the 95 thesis of Martin Luther as spawning the reformation Many times people really do not know not even one thesis of Martin Luther. Well, let me urge you to memorize at least thesis number one. Thesis number one of Martin Luther was when our Lord and Master said repent, he meant that the whole of the Christian life is repentance. Because there are many who think reformation is about justification by faith. So it has little to say of repentance that is not true that's why the very first thesis of the 95 by Luther is about repentance and it is about the whole of the Christian life so uh, it is not true that uh, when we confess our sin that is no need for repentance you cannot confess without a repentant heart but then do not think of repentance as something that you must associate with a certain uh, number of external steps to do it is the disposition of the heart to sin that you acknowledge it as sin that it is against god's law and therefore deserving of god's wrath but in christ there is no more condemnation and thus you confess your sin with a free acceptance of the forgiveness of god but an acceptance that does not make you loose about sin, but rather even more watchful. Another question, ang tanong ko po ay ganito, may limitations po ba ang Christian liberty? Kung meron po ito po ba ay kung sa usapin na magkakasala ang mga makakakita sa ini-execute na liberty ng isang Kristiyano. Well, that is more in the third session to be addressed so come back tomorrow uh, third session i will address christian liberty as it pertains to conduct it is li uh, liberty from prohibitionism those who think of christian life as do not do this do not do that so prohibitionism but on the other hand liberty from libertinism i can do this i can do that uh, either of this will be a, an abuse of Christian liberty but more of that tomorrow
Pastor, there's another question from uh, the live audience. May proper prayer ba ang salvation? Then second question, save but save ba ang taong nakakilala pero nagkakasala pa din ng immoral sin tapos biglang namatay? May prayer ba ng salvation? Well, the, the Romans 10.13 says, uh, those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So you get to encounter Jesus savingly by calling upon Him. But you do not formulate it. In other words, you do not reduce it to a formula of prayer that repeat after me and then think that because He has repeated the verbal formula that He is therefore saved. This is what is called decisionism. And that is perhaps one of the uh, one of the great pandemics in the spiritual world is this decisionism that makes people obtain assurance that they are going to heaven because they have done a formula. And that includes a formula prayer. No, it's being focused on who Christ is and that you respond to Him. So it's about Him, not about what you are doing. Uh, that's the, the point of uh, responding to Christ. Now to the second question. Save po ba yung taong nakakilala pero nakakagawa pa rin ng immoral sin then namatay? Una, uh, more generally, nagkakasala pa ba ang isang naligtas? Answer is yes. In fact, we are taught by Jesus a daily prayer which includes forgive us our sin. And because it's a daily prayer because part of the petitions I give us this day our daily bread. So that it is meant to be prayed daily. But next to that is forgive us our sin. So therefore, we daily commit sin. Now, is it possible for a Christian to commit an immoral sin? Uh, it depends what you mean by immoral, but uh, there is no sin that a Christian uh, cannot commit in terms of the continuing remaining sin in his life and if he is a true believer it is possible that he may commit sin and the very process of committing sin kills him and that may be in fact either chastisement of God uh, but that does not mean that his salvation is compromised or it can even be a mercy of God how so that first corinthians 11 says uh, of those who uh, those who abuse the lord's supper paul said many of you sleep or many of you are sick and even sleep that is they are dead because we are judged by god so that we may not be judged with the world so even a christian dying early maybe one possibility is as chastisement for his sin or even as an act of God's mercy so that he may not continue in a life of sin. So that is not uh, to say that kasi kung sabi mong namatay na may hindi pa na confess na kasalanan, babagsak tayo sa Roman Catholicism na you have your venial sin and your mortal sin. If you die with a mortal sin and confess, you go to hell you die with a venial sin and confess you go to purgatory and so you need to make sure you always confess your sins so you go to heaven and that is basically salvation by works so uh, we do not believe that we believe there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus again that is not to say that uh, the person the Christian does not sin so we always entwine Romans 8 with Romans 7. Lagi nating ikambal ang Romans 8 at Romans 7 because they are the picture or the portrayal of the Christian life on two dimensions or two sides. The reality of struggle with sin, Romans 7, and yet the reality of living in the Spirit, that's Romans 8. Both happen to the believer. 
what should I do if I keep failing as a Christian? Well, again, if you mean by failing, you keep sinning. That's the reason why we continue to confess our sin and continue to pray that the Lord will give you more progress in sanctification. You never cease to pray that. I know 40 years in the ministry, uh, that is a daily prayer of mine that the Lord will forgive my sins and that I will not relent in my pursuit of holiness. And then you specify what are those things that you think you are being carried away by certain sins and you pray that those sins will be uh, overcome by the grace of God. So there is not a time on this side of glory when we will come to a point of no longer having to confess, no longer having to pray for more grace so that we may live in holiness and obedience. Another question po, Pastor. Uh, how do you teach the law to your congregation without making them guilty? Do you use the law as part of your oversight for your Christian, oh, for the Christian majority? If you teach the law and no one is feeling guilty, you're teaching it wrongly. <laughs> because that's what the law is meant to do. Now, in order to deal with their guilt, you point them to Christ. That's the point. So, uh, that's the, what the law is calculated to do is make us see our guilt. But even as Christians, we fail to obey perfectly. And our very imperfection will translate in, the, in a sense of guilt. We do not obey God perfectly. We sin even in our minds, in our thoughts, in our attitudes. Even if we do not sin externally, uh, those are still sins. And therefore, when we teach the law, they are meant to uh, stir up our guilt. But by pointing them to Christ, we also stir up our gratitude for the <clears throat> what God has done in grace through Jesus Christ. So uh, the summary of the Heidelberg Catechism, uh, remember the three G's, guilt, grace, gratitude. Those are the three terms that should define the Christian life. Guilt, grace, gratitude. If you go through the uh, Lord's Days of the Heidelberg Catechism, those are the three areas that they are intended to steer in us. When does the justification of an elect happen? Is it when Christ finished his substitutionary sacrifice for the elect or when a person actually believed? Well, justification as a salvation blessing is received when we believe. As clear in uh, Romans 5.1, having been justified by faith. So it is when we believe that we are justified and that is corroborated by many other New Testament texts. So eternal justification, which was taught by some hyper-Calvinists, of the 17th and 18th century made popular by John Gill. Uh, this is not biblical teaching. There is a time when we are under condemnation, even if we are elect. In fact, you do not know that you are God's elect until you are justified. Even if election happens as uh, something before the foundation of the world, in consciousness, you do not know it until you receive the gospel. Uh, that's what uh, Ian, or Dr. Ian Densham just preached from 1 Thessalonians 1. 1. Uh, Paul says, knowing your election of God, how? Because our word 
came to you, uh, not only in word but in power. So that means you get to know that you are God's elect because of the effect of the gospel. So you do not have salvation blessings as such until you come to that uh, conversion point of believing. Another question from the whole pastor uh, and gratitude. Thank you po for the message, pastor. You have mentioned the verse that says, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace in Romans chapter 8 and 6. We know that in our current state, we are not fully sanctified yet since Christians can still sin. Uh, in thoughts. The question is, is it possible for a believer to be carnally minded? It is possible for a believer to be carnal in some areas of his life. That is what Paul means by 1 Corinthians 3, 3 and following, where he indicts the Corinthians that they are still carnal and not spiritual. Now, many have used this to uh, to support the notion of a carnal Christian that is someone who does not have Christ as Lord in the in his life but he's still saved and that is not what Paul is saying he is saying that in some dimension of the life of a Christian life one may have his flesh still ruling in the case of the Corinthians it is the issue of partisanship their divisiveness they are being carnal in that regard. But to say that a Christian in the totality of his life is carnal, uh, there is another verse that applies to that. Romans 8, 7 says, uh, to be carnally minded is death. So, uh, no. No to carnal Christian teaching. But yes, Christians do have carnal areas of life that they need to progress in sanctification as they, as they deal with those areas of life. So you never get to rest in the issue of progressive sanctification. Another question, Pastor. Uh, how can we know the extent and scope of ceremonial law? sa New Testament uh, na ito ay para lamang sa Jews. Gaya po ng uh, sinabi dun sa Acts 15, 28 and 29, huwag kakain ng dugo o kakarayo. Well, iba yung usapin dun sa Acts 15, it is a matter about the idolatrous lifestyle of Gentiles that uh, those who were converted should not be doing especially because of the Jews. Uh, tandaan natin yung umbrella doon ay to abstain from idolatry. And then under that, you have some of those things being done in idolatrous practice which includes fornication and that is temple prostitution. It's not about the Ten Commandments of you shall not commit adultery, but it's about uh, pagan practices in an idolatrous worship. So that includes uh, to abstain from blood. Again, it is not saying that uh, we are not to eat binubuan. Uh, it is saying that these are the matters that go on in idolatrous practice. So if you abstain from idolatry, which is sinful and offensive to the Jews, so Gentile converts should be wary that they do not offend their Jewish brethren by uh, by restraining themselves from those activities that are associated with idolatry. Again, I will touch on that more when I deal with uh, liberty in Christian conduct. Go ahead, Mom. Another question, Pastor. Uh, it was said that Whoever blaspheme against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven in this age or in the age to come. 
uh, he has a two question uh, what does it mean uh, and is it possible for a believer to commit this sin and even uh, the elect well uh, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit occurs in Matthew 12, 32 and following. And in the context, we see that the Pharisees were guilty of two things, or there were two elements in what Jesus describes as blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. One is clear knowledge. Uh, they got to see what Jesus is, and it was proof positive of who he claims to be. And yet, with the knowledge, is persistent resistance a hardened resistance against the message of Jesus Christ. So there is no forgiveness, first, not because it's too much that God himself has nothing more to give. That's not the point. It is not pardonable, again, not because the blood of Christ did not include uh, some sins. Rather, it is unpardonable in the sense that a person in that condition persists a clear knowledge and persistent resistance will never himself accept the message that alone can give him pardon. So that means unpardonable because of the sin of resisting the message of forgiveness, not because God is unwilling or unable to forgive such a heinous sin. Uh, can a Christian commit that? The very fact that you are concerned that you are committing the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is proof positive that you are not committing blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Remember, again, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is that persistent, hardened resistance to what you already know uh, and realize is true of Jesus Christ. Uh, Pastor, uh, for us not to misinterpret uh, the phrase law and gospel, how can we understand its relation and distinction? Kasi doon nagkakaroon ng madalas na ano eh, akala ng uh, iba, yung law yun yung paraan ng kaligtas, that's all, that's yung gospel sa inyo. So how can we have that simple handle in understanding its relation and its distinction. Well, in terms of redemptive history, uh, the law is that which is surrounding the Mosaic law. And the Mosaic law has come to fulfillment in Jesus Christ. That's what John 1.17 says. The law came by Moses, but grace and truth came through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, truth there is not truth versus error. Because that would mean Moses was in error. And he was not. Uh, truth there means fulfillment, realization. Moses was only preparatory. So that's Mosaic law. It is to prepare for fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Uh, that's redemptive history. Uh, the truth, the fulfillment is now in Christ to so all the Mosaic law, both the moral law and the ceremonial law are fulfilled in Christ. But fulfillment of the ceremonial law in Christ means it's abrogation. Whereas fulfillment of the moral law in Christ means it's elevation to a new administration, which is the Holy Spirit so that the Christian may obey it not for justification, but because he is justified. He is justified in Christ, now he obeys it. So it's some difference between uh, the mosaic and the grace that came through Jesus Christ. And uh, that's law and gospel in redemptive history. Now, when it comes to a message of law and a message of grace, the message of law is that which says you must do this. Whereas the message of grace is saying Jesus has done it. And through Christ, we obey what is now the law under a new administration. Final question. Go ahead, Mo. Uh, is it 
okay to judge our brethren based on the law? Are we not like the Pharisees if we do that? This is the last question from the audience, Pastor. Judge, we are told in Romans 7, 24, judge righteous judgment. And you cannot make a righteous judgment without some reference to what it is the law demands. And therefore, there is a proper use of the law to judge. But now for Christians, that means it all the more highlights that they should be obedient to the law. You're a Christian, you may now never be judged using the law. Rather, the more it highlights that now that you're a Christian, you're expected to be to have more regard for the law of God because it is now under the administration of Christ through the Spirit. You now have the prompting and the motivation that unbelievers do not have. So, uh, uh, but when using the law to make an evaluation of one's Christian life, it must always be entwined with the gospel of Jesus Christ so that it checks not only your part of performance of obedience, but the motivation, the prompting that you are obeying the law. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, not as without law to God, but under law to Christ. So we are under law, but under the administration of Jesus Christ. And that is what I mean by this first issue of Christian liberty. We are liberated from the law as condemning in order that we may obey it uh, as under Christ, free from legalism and antinomianism. Thank you very much.